Hello guys, Lone Vic here. I'm back yet again. Welcome to my channel. Today we are discussing how to play Castles of Mad King Ludwig, the Royal Collector's Edition. This is a gigantic box with all of the add-ons, all of the expansions, all of the goodness that Castles of Mad King Ludwig entails. This is my first encounter with this game. I haven't played any of the old versions and right now I'm really into building those rooms and connecting them with the corridors and everything. So I would like to quickly explain to you how to play this game both in multiplayer, solo mode, with all the expansions and everything. So we'll try to cover all the things that are in this box right now. If you like the video, if you enjoy the content on my channel, if you would like to support what I'm doing here, there is a like button under the video, click the subscribe button and ring the notification bell to be notified about new videos. Let me know in the comments your opinions about Castles of Mad King Ludwig if you would like to share. And right now, let's take a look at how to set up this beautiful game of so many cool components. Let's go! Okay guys, so first things first, you need to place this Summer Lake scoreboard, as it is called, on one end of the table. And depending on the configuration, you may also flip it to the other side, where there is a more of a square, similar shape. This is more rectangular, but it fits into my viewport on my camera, so this is basically good. Now, those indentations here are for these island trays that we will be using throughout the game. So now you need to place all of the islands that you can find in the box into those indentations. Like so. You can remove these purple cards for now. They will be needed later on because here we've got the room cards and the place for the discard. Now, this is the deck of all the room cards in the game. And if you are playing without the tower expansion, you will need to go through this deck right now and remove all of the cards with this 325 size. If you are, however, playing with the towers module or expansion, as you will, you will need to include those five tower cards with those 325 sizes into the deck that you will be using with the game. So, as you can see, I removed five cards right now. So this is like I'm preparing for the base game right now. You give those a good shuffle. And here you have in all of those basically indentations for tokens, for rooms or for cards, you have the numbers corresponding to the numbers of players in the game. So this number tells you that if you have two players playing the game, you need 22 cards from the deck. If you have three players, 33, basically 11 cards per player. So if I would be setting up a two player game, I would need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 cards, and the rest can go back into the box. And if this is a game that's using the tower expansion, replace five of these cards with those five 325s that you've set aside earlier. Give everything a good shuffle, obviously, and you place those here. And the discard pile is over here. Okay, next we have the rooms that we need to place into those indentations here. And for every pocket, you've got the numbers printed here per player count. So if you are Playing with two players, you need four rooms with size 400. If you are playing with five players, there will be seven rooms here and so forth and so on. So now you need to populate all of those. And if you are playing without the tower expansion, don't fill in those 325s. If you are playing with the tower expansion, also put these here. So that's what I will do right now. For each stack of the rooms that you have in the box, you need to give them a good shuffle and count out the exact number that's printed here that you need for the game. So I'm doing a two player setup here. So I'll take one, two, three, four, five hundreds, and then I will just speed run through all the rest of those. Okay. So all of the rooms are filled. We've got four or five, depending on the size of the room and the numbers printed in the inlays 
of rooms with this. And if you are playing with the Towers expansion, which is required if you are playing with five player game and it's optional for all other player counts, you need to place one plastic tower in each of these indentations here. So let's do that right now. Next, you should take all of those King's Favor tokens that you have in the box. I won't be taking all of them because there are quite a few. And if you are playing a normal game, place an amount here equal to the number of players. So if you've got a two player game, you place two random tokens here face up, three player game gives you three, four player game and five player game gives you five. So I will place one, two for a two player game. And if you are playing with the Towers expansion, you need to place some favor tokens down in this stack on the island tray. And for two players, you put 15 inside. For three players, you put 18, 21 for four players and 24 per five players. So basically it's three tokens per one tile of towers that you've put here in the previous step. So I should place 15 over here. So let's say this is 15, okay? and I will just throw them in here quietly. And the rest unused goes back into the box. Those bonus cards should be shuffled and left over here. You can take out all of the money tokens that the game provides. I will just place a symbolic number on the table and place them somewhere nearby as a bank for all the players to be close to, like so. Next, you take an amount of cards from this room deck to populate this display of rooms. So if you are playing with two players, you will need one, two, three, four, five rooms. If you are playing three players, you will need six rooms, four players is seven rooms. And if you're playing with a five player game, you will need two rooms in this first slot. So you will need eight cards. So this is a two player game. So I'm pulling out five cards. I'm placing rest here and I'm taking one 450 room, one 100 room, another 450 room, 150 and 250 and those cards land in the discard pile over here face up. And right now leave them somewhere near the board because they will be distributed later on. If you are playing with the Swans expansion, you will need to take out all of these blue Swan tokens from the box and there are quite a lot of them. So I won't be taking all of them out on the table right now and place them face down somewhere nearby, like for example, close to the bank. So there will be quite a lot of them here. Okay, but I will just take a few again symbolically. And if you are playing with the moats expansion, you need to place the moats, so these tiles also somewhere in easy reach for players. I will place them here on the side and this is it for the general setup. Now let's talk about what you need to give to the players. So I will set up one player here as an example, okay? And each player basically goes through the same setup. So give each player one player aid, obviously. Each player needs a foyer tile and a swan in the same color. 15,000 in cash, because these coins are counted per thousand, as you will see. So like so, three bonus cards from the deck, one, two, and three. If you are playing with the moats expansion, give each player a Barbican tile. And if you are playing with the secret passages expansion, give each player one of each of the three types of secret passages. Decide which player is going to be the master builder and give them the first player token or the master builder token. And whichever player is the master builder, they place their swan on the zero space. And the next person to their left places their swan on one victory point, the next one on two, three or four. If it's a five player game, then the last player will place it on the space of four. So each uh, player that is after the master builder gets one 
additional victory point. So I will be setting up a game with all of the expansions. So right now you insert this foyer tile into your barbican. So to connect this mode with your foyer, I will place these bad boys, those secret passages onto the side. I will place the coins also somewhere nearby. So somewhere here, so that I have some room. Okay, and the last thing, if you are playing with the Royal Decree cards, which is this last add-on that's possible to expand, give two more cards than there are players to the last player in line. So in a case of a two-player game, you would give four cards to the player who doesn't have the Master Builder token, and that player chooses one of these cards places it face down in front of them, passes this to the player who is before them in turn order, that player selects one card and so forth and so on until each player has selected one card and then you simultaneously reveal this card. And this card is going to be a passive effect that will work for you for the entire game. So you just leave it somewhere nearby and everybody is aware of this one. And all the other Royal Decree cards are returned to the box. From those three bonus cards, each player has to choose two that they will keep and discard one of them to the bottom of the deck. And after this happens, the last thing that is going to be done is that the master builder, so whoever has this token, arranges these five initial rooms that we drew from the room deck so that there is one under every price slot. In a two-player game, one will cost 15,000, one 10,000, 8,000, six, and 4,000, and these slots are reserved for three and four-player games. So for example, I will arrange them like so for the first round. There you go. And right now, you are ready to start a game of Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Okay guys, so how do we play this game? If you've played Suburbia, you will be kind of at home in this game because even some of the components look similar, like the uh, King's Favors and the rules of the game for calculating points. But let's go through this one by one. So on your player aid, you have all of those actions repeated. And at the beginning of every round, basically, there are a few things that the master builder has to do. And this is adding 1,000, so one coin to all remaining room tiles, which you don't do in the beginning of the game, but in the next round. You fill in the empty spaces, which we also don't do right now. You put one room under each space, so we have that. And if there are any rooms with swans, because you're playing with the swan add-on, you draw, the master builder draws one swan token and places it on this room. So as you can see, you need this swan icon in the corner here, in the bottom right corner of the room. That means that you need to place a swan token onto those rooms. And after all those initial steps happen, the master builder becomes kind of the last player in the round. So he will be doing the last purchase out of all of those rooms. So during a round, the player who is to the left of the master builder will go first and then we will be circling around and the master builder will be going last. So what are the options? What can you do when it's your turn? You can purchase any one of those rooms provided that you can add it into your castle and we will go back to this in a moment. Or you can take 5,000 from the bank into your cash reserve. So those are the two things that you do. And if you are purchasing a room, you pay the money that is above the room price, not into the bank, but you pay the money to the master builder. So each player will be paying money for the rooms to the master builder each round, and the master builder token will be each round traveling to a different player. So you'll be basically exchanging the money. And when it finally is the master builder's turn to purchase a room, they will be paying it into the bank. Apart from buying rooms or taking 5,000, if you are playing with the modes expansion, you can also purchase a mode for 5,000 cash 
cash. And there is also a reminder here that if you are purchasing a moat, you need to discard one card from the deck without doing anything and you add a moat here or here, for example, if you can. So let's talk about what happens with the rooms. When you are purchasing a room tile, you have to be able to legally place it in your castle. And I will rearrange this a bit so that I can zoom in a bit better so that you can see what's going on. So initially you have the foyer, which is in the Barbican right now, which has one, two, three exits here, as you can see, and the Barbican has a fourth exit over here. So when you purchase a room, let's say that I have purchased this one, in order to legally place it in your castle, you must put it so that one of the entrances on the new room aligns with any one entrance in any of the existing rooms in your castle. So this room has only one entrance, so I wouldn't be able to place it like this. I would be able to place it like this, or for example, like this. Or over here. You can't place any rooms outside of the castle apart from gardens, so those green ones with the tree symbol in the corner. Gardens are the only buildings that you can place outside. See the tree symbol here. Okay, and there are a few rules to how you can place those rooms. They can be placed in any 90 degree orientation. Your castle has to be set up so there is at least one exit, so you can't make a castle which has all the entrances blocked and there is no exit to the outside of the castle. The rooms cannot overlap each other, so I wouldn't, for example, be able to... I don't have any good rooms for an example right now, but I wouldn't be able to place something like this and then place a room like so. So they can't overlap, never. No rooms can be adjacent to this top section of a garden. If you have a garden room, then this top section of a garden always has to remain open, so nothing can touch it. And you also cannot connect upper floor rooms with downstairs rooms directly. And what it means is that there are basically three types of rooms in this game, but right now I will tell you about this downstairs room especially. So downstairs rooms, as you can see, have those stairs down symbols. And if you want to connect them to your castle, you first, during your turn, need to build stairs that will lead down and you will be able to connect the room here. And if you later, for example, in this kind of situation, like we've got this room connected here, if you want later, you can connect another downstairs room to this exit over here. But if you want to connect an upstairs room, you will need another set of stairs that will lead from the downstairs room into an upstairs room. So this is the only legal method of connecting a downstairs room into your castle using the stairs. Okay, so since I started talking about room types, then let's talk about room types. So there are basically three room types. And why is this important? Because once you purchase a room during your turn and you add it into your castle, you automatically score some points for those rooms. You always score the points that are in the top left corner of the room. So for example, this coach house will give you three points, this small yard one point, and this west tapestry room gives you two points, this mold room in the basement will give you two points, and you also score the condition in the middle of the room. And there are three types of conditions. The rooms with those gray walls that are on the ground floor and they look like so, always have a condition that they get additional points per a special type of room connected via entrances to this one. So for example, this small yard, let's zoom in on this, this small yard gives me one point if I connect it to my castle, but it also will give me one point per every entertainment room, so with a symbol of a guitar or something, that is connected to any of the entrances directly. So if I, for example, later on connected this room here, then 
I would get one point for this because those points are added every single time that this condition gets triggered, no matter which turn it is after even building this room. So if I place this room in my castle here right now in one turn, I will get only one point. But then in my next move, if I add this room here, I would get one point from this because I've connected it directly via an entrance to a room with an instrument symbol. And also I would get three points for this room, placing it in the castle, right? And those rooms with the red walls around them mean that you get negative points if there is a room of those indicated types neighboring this room, not only via entrances, but also touching via the walls. So if, for example, I later, for some reason, had this room connected somehow here, then this room would deduce me one point because this is this type of room with this fire icon, right? So remember that the rooms with the gray walls give you those bonus scorings in the middle only when you connect something relevant via entrances. The red rooms give you those negative points in the middle even when the indicated building is only touching a wall, not necessarily is connected via the door. And the basement rooms give you obviously the points in the upper left corner, but also will give you this scoring, so two points in the case of the mold room, every single time a room with this symbol is added to your castle, no matter where. So those basement rooms can be pretty useful. Okay, so this is the basic scoring for those icons on the rooms. So Every single time a player purchases a room, they add it to their castle legally, score the top left corner and the center of the room if there is a possibility. And when you add a next room into your castle on your next turn, you need to remember to always check whether any of those middle scorings on the existing rooms have triggered because, well, they might, basically. And it's also similar when you are adding a moat, which obviously can't overlap any room tiles, because the moat also gives you, as you can see, three victory points when you add it, and also one victory point every single time you add any type of this building or for existing buildings as well, rooms, sorry, in your castle, you get one point for any of those. So modes can be very useful, but they also limit your building space. And the last function of an add-on are those secret passages. So if you are connecting a room in your castle, you can use a secret passage to connect two entrances, the condition being that those rooms cannot connect directly to each other in any other way, and then those secret passages double the reward on the room. So for example, if I had this room already in my castle and I purchased this one and connected it via this secret passage, then this would count this guitar symbol twice. So I would get two victory points for this room because there is a double symbol on those secret passages. And all of them work the same, they just have different shapes. Okay, so basically you go around purchasing the rooms, paying the money to the master builder, and when the master builder purchases a room, he pays to the bank. And after that, there might be some rooms left because nobody has purchased them, and we go into another round. You pass the master builder token to the next player on the left, and that player draws as many cards as there are missing rooms. So in this case, two. He takes those rooms, so a 500 and 300 that I drew on the cards. He adds 1,000 in cash to each room that wasn't purchased in the previous round. Also here he needs to add the master builder needs to add a swan because there is a swan symbol and the master builder can rearrange any rooms right now so that the prices change again and the whole situation repeats and repeats and repeats until 
this deck is emptied. Once this deck is emptied, you have triggered the final round and the game will end after the round with this, uh, when the deck got depleted, ends. Okay, but before we talk about endgame scoring, I would like to tell you also about one more thing that happens here, because adding rooms into the castle is not the only way of scoring victory points here. The other method of doing something with the rooms is closing rooms or completing rooms. And what does it mean to complete a room? A room is completed when all entrances from this room connect to entrances of other rooms or stairs or hallways. It depends. So if, for example, I have this garden and it has one entrance here and one entrance here and I would add purchase this room, collecting this 1000 also, and add it here, I would have not only got one point for adding this room to the castle, but I would also have closed this garden because both entrances are closed, and I would also close this building because it has only one entrance and it became closed. So after you complete a room, you take a look at your player aid to see what reward you get for completing a room. And there are different ones, as you can see. So if you complete a food room with this icon of a glass, you can take one extra turn immediately. If you complete a utility room with this hammer and anvil symbol, you take two bonus cards and keep one of them, adding them to your hand. If you complete a living room with a fireplace, you score the completed room again. So you score both the upper left corner and the central icon of this room. If you complete a garden like I did here, you gain 10,000 cash. If you complete a sleeping room with a triple Z symbol, you choose zero, one or two buildings from any stack and you can add them to the top of the room deck so that they will be taken out first before any cards. So you kind of prolong the game thanks to that. Completing an activity room gives you five victory points. If you complete a corridor, so hallways and stairs can also be completed, and this foyer as well, you can add one stairs or one hallway for free once per turn into your castle. And when it comes to the downstairs rooms, every second, fourth or sixth completed and so forth and so on. So every even completed downstairs room allows you to choose any other of those seven actions for room completion. If you manage to close your moat all around your building, you can choose zero on one or one rooms from a stack and add it to your castle. So you can basically take one room and add it directly to your castle. And then there are towers. So the towers are pretty special because not only when you close them do you get the rewards for the type. So this is a triple Z. So you will get this reward for completion, but you would also be able to take three king's favors from your stack, take a look at them, choose one, place it here and cover it with the relevant tower. And this means that at the end of the game, you will score this king's favor as you score the normal ones, but only you will get victory points for it, for the place that you take compared with the other players. And the remaining two king's favors would go into this discard column over here. So this is your private king's favor. Okay, so this is basically it when it comes to how the game flows and what happens around the table during the game. And now let's talk about scoring at the end of the game. So once the deck is depleted and the uh, last round finishes, we take a look at all the victory points obviously collected throughout the game by adding the rooms and collecting all of those victory points from the rooms. And then each stack of rooms that got depleted throughout the game will give you two victory points per room of that type in your castle. So for example, if this stack got depleted at the end of the game, each player with a room of a size of 500 would get two points 
her this kind of rule. If you are playing with the swans add-on, you will get points for collecting those swans. And you collect the swans by purchasing the rooms on which the swans are placed. And you place them, we place them on the moat thematically, right? And the swans have two functions. During the game, you can exchange those swans for cash. So for example, a swan of a single color, if you throw it out, if you remove it from, from your moat, let's say, will give you 1,000 of cash. Two swans will give you 3,000. Three swans will give you 6,000. Four swans will give you 10,000. And if you throw out five swans that you've collected, you will get 15,000 of cash. But at the end of the game, swans of different colors create sets. And a set of different colors of swans will give you points as shown on the player aid. So if you have a set of one single swan of a color, you will get one point. Two different colors give you three points. Six points for free. 10 points for four different colors and 15 points for five different colors. So for example, in, let's zoom in, a situation like this, if I had, let's say, like this, then during the game, I would be able to exchange, for example, five of them for 15,000 cash. That's pretty good. But at the end of the game, I would have one set of four different colors and one set of two different colors. So that, would give me 10 plus 3, 13 points for the swans. Then, if you are playing with those cards, with the royal decrees, each player counts the victory points granted by the royal decrees, if any. Then we calculate the king's favors, and the first player who has the most of the designated type, all of those tiles and all of the cards are explained very well in the rule book, so I won't be going into detail here, will get eight points, the second place will get four points, third place two points, fourth place one point. In the case of a draw, you tally up the first two places, for example. If there is a draw for the first place, you tally up both, divide by two and round up and give those points to the players and the next player gets the third place. And you also then score your secret king's favors that are under the towers. But remember that for those, only you get the victory points. Then you look at your bonus cards and you score based on the bonus cards. And again, they're very well explained in the rulebook, so I won't be going into details here. And last but not least, every 10,000 of cash that you have left at the end of the game gives you one victory point. The person who has the most victory points at the end of the game wins. And this is basically it in a nutshell. Now, like I said, I won't be going through all of the effects and all of the uh, information on those King's Favor tokens and the cards and so forth and so on because the rulebook has a very good appendix explaining every single type of card and every single type of point scoring. So you can basically go there and check it out. So right now I will move on to tell you very quickly at how to play a solo game of the Castles of Mad King Ludwig. If you're interested in that, please stay tuned. If not, Thank you for watching. My name was Lone Vic. This was Castles of Mad King Ludwig. If you liked the video and if you found it helpful, you can support my channel by clicking the like button, hitting the subscribe and ringing the notification bell. And thank you very much for watching. See you soon. Have a great day and bye bye. If, however, you want to stick around and see how to play the solo game, here it comes. Okay, so when you are setting up a game solo, for Castles of Mad King Ludwig, you set up a game like you would do for three players. But you do not turn over any room cards and you do not place any king's favors, basically. So all of those things go out from here. You, as the solo player, take two bonus cards, 15,000 in cash, and a foyer in the color that you've chosen and your swan lands on the zero space. And each turn you flip over three room cards, three room cards, right? And you place the rooms in order on the 
2,000, 4,000 and 6,000 price points. And these are the rooms that you can choose from in your turn. And you, place, you, you play your turn as usual, purchasing the room, adding it to your tower, connecting it to your foyer via corridors or whatever, scoring the points. And at the end of the turn, you remove any unpurchased room tiles and you place them back into the box. If you take 5,000 on your turn, instead of purchasing a room, or if you have built hallways or stairs, instead of taking a room, you still remove all of the tiles from below the scoreboard. And you play the game as normal with the money that you pay going into the supply, obviously. And basically you just calculate the score at the end of the game. And if the score is below 60, you are a court jester. And if it's above 110, you are the regal supreme chancellor of Grand Castle construction. So it's basically a game where you're playing against yourself. There are no bots, there are no automas to be playing against here. And that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. And I will repeat once more, if you want to support my channel and what I'm doing here, there is the like button, subscribe, ringing the notification bell, leaving a trace in the comments is also very helpful for some traffic and activity below the videos. For now, this was me, Lone Vic, explaining how to play the Castles of Mad King Ludwig, the Royal Collector's Edition, as you can see. Thanks very much for watching. You can check out the unboxing video of this game as well on my channel and very soon there will be a solo play once I find some more time. For now, thank you very much. Have a great day and bye-bye.